so glad you can join me today on Understanding the Times Radio. And I'm looking at a different angle this week in the world of apologetics and that tease of a little soundbite. Rick Wiles, we'll say more about him throughout the hour because he represents what I would call Christian anti-Semitism, but we'll talk about that later. I think the question after that clip, are Jews really a part of the synagogue of Satan? I mean, wasn't Jesus a Jew and isn't the nation of Israel the epicenter of end time activity? Thus, shouldn't Christians rally around this group of people and their homeland? Well, there are many who actually call themselves evangelical Christians who believe differently. They are calling those who stand with Israel deceived and worse. Going back to that sound clip there. And what about Gentiles who want to become Jews in what is known as the Hebrew Roots Movement? Is this biblically sound? We don't think so, and we're going to talk about that this hour as well. So I'm speaking with two representatives of Chosen People Ministries this hour, Trevor Rubenstein and Olivier Melnick. Trevor headquarters here in the Twin Cities. Olivier is headquartering in Texas. I'm going to play a number of sound bites as well to complement our discussion. And some of them are troubling. I want to be frank. I would say they're not disturbing, but they're troubling. So just be prepared for that as I play them throughout the hour. Trevor and Olivier, welcome to Understanding the Times Radio. Thanks for having us, Jan. Thank you, Jen. Good to be on your show. Trevor, let me start with you. Why don't you give us sort of the Reader's Digest version? How did you, as a Jewish unbeliever, come to faith? I'm from the Iron Range of Minnesota, like yourself. I was born and raised in a conservative Jewish family. When I was young, we moved to Colorado. I was a troubled kid. I had issues. I was involved with, let's say, recreational pharmaceutical test engineers, probably what I was doing most of in my high school years, unfortunately, and ended up getting kicked out of school, in which case I went to a local community college and I was tricked into a Bible study. I say this because I wouldn't have participated in one being Jewish myself and understanding it's something we can't do. In this Bible study, we read the words of Jesus for the first time, and it was also the first time I ever felt the presence of God. Really, three things became very apparent to me, one of which was everything that I was doing in my life was separating me from God. Another thing was that God was even real because I was an atheist at this Mm. point in time. And the other thing was that the only way I can come to know him is through this person, Jesus. After struggling with this for a little while, I eventually gave my life to him, at which point, Jan, he removed a lot of troubles I was having. I was suicidal. And so God really saved my life. And so for me, Jesus was the difference between life and death. And so my goal and my hope and my focus was to introduce other people to him, not just in a physical sense, but obviously in an Mm. eternal one also. Of course, I wasn't raised in the Iron Range. My parents certainly were. And you and I talked this morning. I think you and I are even related. Everybody up there is related. Bobby Dylan, I'm related to him. and He's a shirt tail relative of mine as well. Me too. Olivier, yourself, how did you come to faith? This was in the mid-80s. I had met my American wife in California and then fell in love. And then she she came to France and she started to witness to me. And she gave me the messianic prophecies. I was born in France of a Jewish family. My parents survived the war. My mother survived the Holocaust and hid on a farm in the south of France. They lost their faith in God. So this is how I was raised up. And my wife came to me. She said, you know, she started talking to me about Jesus. And I said, I'm Jewish. You're a Gentile. Can we just agree to disagree? Mm -hmm. That just didn't work. She insisted. And eventually she gave me a book on prophecy titled The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. And I read that book and I got to the place about the rapture and I got really scared. And I thought, well, this is kind of stupid thing that she believes, if that's true. But just in case it's true. So I asked her, I said, you really believe in that? She said, yes, I don't have the details. But that's exactly why I don't want to marry you right now, because I don't want to be separated from you. And one thing led to another. And eventually I thought that I was just procrastinating the inevitable because I had no reason not to believe. I had not been raised religious. I was a secular Jew. So I thought, this makes sense. And all those prophecies that I read in that little book, all of them were fulfilled literally in the first coming. And he was saying at the second coming, they will all be fulfilled literally. Why would we believe any otherwise? So that's what convinced me. So in the summer of 83, I gave my life to the Lord. Wonderful. Those are faith building stories. And I was in Jewish evangelism directly as well for many years and encouraged by hearing how you gentlemen came to faith. I kind of want to start our discussion out and I don't want to protract this a great deal, but I think we need to 
spend a few minutes on it. I want to read an email, and then I want to play a sound bite, and then I want to discuss it. The email will explain where we're going. I'm not going to give the gal's name. She doesn't give me permission. She just says this about her sister and herself as well. They have always had the mentality of to the Jew first, and they love Israel, that they are Gentile. And she says, my sister has been struggling this past year with different aspects of what should she be doing in her walk with the Lord, concerning at what level does she need to be participating in her walk as if she were Jewish. Now, she's not, okay? She continues, she observes Shabbat and serves dinner with all of the appropriate accoutrements. She recently read some article that if a Christian does not follow all the laws in the Torah and keep all the feasts, that they will not have salvation. She says, I told her Paul had that discussion with the other disciples and asked, why would we put the Gentiles under the same bondage we were just freed from? The email goes on, but you can understand here's one sister who's not into Hebrew roots, so concerned about the other sister who is into Hebrew roots. Let me play a quick soundbite. It's apologist Mike Winger, and I was intrigued. He does YouTube question and answers. One of the top questions he gets is, what is this Hebrew roots? You asked for me to look into the Hebrews roots movement right there. I actually asked you guys last year towards the end of the year, what was one topic you wanted me to cover, wanted me to talk about, wanted me to spend some time researching. And this is the thing that got the most votes from you, your votes to say, hey, put this on the top of your list, Mike. And so I have, I've put it on the top of my list and I'm ready to actually talk about it now. Um, at least this will be the first video. I'll probably do one or two more on this topic because I think it just has to be done. There's so much to talk about. So in short, what is the Hebrew Roots Movement? What am I talking about? What is this about today? Um, the Hebrew Roots Movement is a growing movement of people, generally speaking, not Jewish people. So I say Hebrew Roots, it's not about Jewish people here. They're, um, they're mostly Gentile believers who are, are m many of them, most of them believe in Jesus, um, who think that they should obey the law of Moses. If, if there's one theme that goes through the entire Hebrew Roots movement. It's you should obey the law of Moses to the best of your ability. Um, now, some of them are Christians who think that it's a good idea and it's desired. God simply wants us to obey the law of Moses. And they might call themselves Hebrew Roots or they might use the term Messianic or they might use another. They have lots of different terminologies they use. I don't think it's important to memorize those right now. Um, that's one group. It's just desired. Another group within the group says it's necessary for salvation. Like if you don't do this, you will not be saved. Okay, that's a group within the group. They think it's necessary for salvation. Then there's another group and they not only do they think it's necessary, they reject the Apostle Paul and anything he wrote in the New Testament, they consider it not scripture. So they chuck the majority of the letters of the New Testament. Um, then within that group, there's also another group that is those who actually reject Jesus himself. Okay, so this is not monolithic. I can't say this is Hebrew, Hebrew roots and just give it one label because within the big broad spectrum, there's this sort of disorganized developing group where there's some who are believers who think they should obey the law of Moses and others who are apostate. They're not Christians. They reject Jesus Christ. So this is difficult to talk about because I can't just... Um, say Hebrew roots is this because those within the movement will not agree with me. Um, so I'm going to take the one commonality of, of the entire Hebrew roots movement. And the commonality is the idea that um, we ought to obey the law of Moses. Some will say it's more than ought, but they will all agree that you should obey the law of Moses as, um, as, as a believer in God today. Olivier Melnick, you've been in Jewish evangelism a good number of years. We all know Jesus came to fulfill the law and the prophets. Help us understand the thinking of those in this movement. I like what this gentleman was saying, that it's not monolithic. Yes. I think it's important to understand that, because once you understand that, it helps you not paint with broad strokes. Uh, there's a lot of people that I meet in all the places that I speak at in the U.S. They come to me and they tell me either, what do you think of, or I'm part of, and I like it, should I do this, should I do that? So some people are part of the Hebrew Roots movement because they just want to discover more about the Jewish perspective, And but some people are pushing something that I think is not biblical. When somebody says we have to be under the Mosaic law, I think they basically don't understand what grace is all mm. about. Now, 
I love to celebrate Passover, but I don't do Passover because I'm under the law and I'm supposed to. I couldn't do it according to the law because we don't have a temple to do sacrifices. But I do it because it points to something that Jesus did, and there's a connection, typologically speaking or prophetically speaking. So there's nothing wrong with doing some Jewish things. Sure. But if it becomes overboard, and plus if they say you have to keep the Mosaic Law, there's many of the 613 commandments that you cannot keep. Right. So my first question is, which one do you keep? Which one do you not keep? Is it okay to pick and choose? Trevor Rubenstein, it is good to emphasize that Christianity is Jewish. I think it's good to emphasize that Christians observe, honor some of the feasts of the Lord, Passover and some of the others. I think all that's fine. But some of these folks are going too far, correct? Jan, I think that it can most clearly be understood through the story that we see in the scriptures of the serpent standard kind of a fascinating thing to go through. But in Numbers chapter 21, the people of Israel are complaining to Moses and God sends fiery serpents that start biting the people of Israel. So God tells the people of Israel to take a bronze serpent and to put it on a pole and then whoever looks on it won't perish. Interestingly, that you have to consider is how is this not idolatry? And eventually it becomes idolatry. In 2 Kings chapter 18, at the very beginning, it states that Hezekiah had to destroy the bronze serpent because the people were worshiping it. And there's actually a third mention of the bronze serpent. It's in John 3, 14. It says, for just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so too must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So much like the Hebrew scriptures, the bronze serpent all points to Jesus. It did from the beginning, the serpent, a symbol of sin, put on a pole, possibly showing judgment to sin, the end to sin. It always pointed to Jesus. So as long as those things are focused on Jesus in themselves, it can be healthy. The problem becomes when the item that was intended to point to him becomes the focus opposed to the Lord himself. And this is a real issue. And sometimes, Jan, when this happens, it becomes incredibly detrimental, as the individual was stating. There are Gentiles that are converting to Judaism in large numbers. In my last communication with a local Orthodox rabbi, he said they can't even handle the amount of Gentile converts because they're becoming so enamored with the Mosaic Covenant, where the Mosaic Covenant is beautiful, wonderful, of course, as Paul says. It's a good thing. The problem is when that's the focus as opposed to whom it was always intended to point to, Jesus, the Word of God brought to life. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. I have in studio... Trevor Rubenstein from Chosen People Ministries. On the line from Texas is Olivier Melnick, and you can reach Olivier at newantisemitism.com, newantisemitism.com. You can reach Trevor at T. Rubenstein at chosenpeople.com, T. Rubenstein at chosenpeople.com. Oh, I have so much in my list of notes here. I think what I'd like to touch on real briefly here is The fact, Trevor, that you have told me that in your experience here as a missionary, that you are encountering Jewish people more open, at least open to listening to what you have to say, more open to the message of the gospel. What do you think has changed? Because that has not always been the case. And I know from personal experience, that has not always been the case. Yeah. And Jan, ever since COVID hit, a lot of Jewish people are starting to think about things other than the things of this world in a way that maybe they weren't previously because it's being promoted as that it's going to kill everyone. So people are thinking about death. And then also it's letting people realize that they can't trust in the things of this world. And so, yeah, we're finding a lot of openness. But Jan, statistically, What's happening nationally with the Jewish people is even more fascinating than what I'm experiencing personally, although I'm having more success in the last two, three years of Jewish outreach than I have had in the previous 10 or so years of my doing this work. I want to play one more clip. It's about what we're talking about. And then, Olivier, I want to come back and have you address it. Now, let me introduce the clip by saying this. We're talking here heavily, at least in this segment, about reaching Jews for Jesus. And that has been a challenge. I can speak to that personally because I did that for a number of years, less so at this point in time, and that it is a challenge indeed. But then there is the camp that says, you know what? The Jews don't need Jesus because they're automatically saved. The theology behind that is called dual covenant theology. And I'm going to play a clip of a Twin Cities pastor who does teach this. You'll hear this in this clip. And then I'd like your feedback, gentlemen. But here's the point. The precedent 
was set. And God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen. Somebody who believes their covenant, that old covenant, they're the seed of Abraham through Isaac, and they believe, and just like Abraham, you know, that belief was counted unto him as for righteousness' sake, and he was saved. Somehow, the Jews that have been believers, that have met the definition of Israel here, that have died over the last 2,000 years, either somehow got to meet Jesus already, or they're going to. Because he said, all Israel will be saved. Now, this is part of the mystery that hasn't been revealed to me. I don't know how to tell you it's going to happen. Maybe Abraham's bosom's still open. Maybe he wants more. He'll lead captivity captive when he comes the second time. I don't know. The word doesn't tell us that. But I do know the precedent has been set. He's going to take care of them. If they were believers, he isn't going to let them die and go to hell. Amen. This means it is not up to the church to evangelize the Jews. A lot of people will say, well, they're going to go to hell if we don't go get them. And that's not what the Word says. Who are you going to believe? Dead church tradition or the Word of God? Choice is yours. But the Word says that they're all going to be saved. I don't know how. I've got some suppositions. I mean, it's possible if Abraham's bosom is closed, then in the last day or two before they die, God gets somebody in front of them and they get saved. Or it could be they have a deathbed experience with the Lord. Who knows? God is God. He just said all Israel will be saved. And so that means for us to make evangelistic thrusts into the Jewish community or going to Israel to see how many Jews we can get saved is the surest way to alienate the Jew rather than bless the Jew. Because you're saying to them, you've been living a life deceived. You don't have a covenant with God. It's dead. You're on your way to hell. You've got to do it my way and become a Christian or else. I mean, you just put somebody on the defensive. You're not going to have a relationship with anybody. And it's not necessary because all Israel will be saved. Now, I would say eight out of ten theologians, you took this sermon to would say, I'm full of bunk. So you're going to have to read this for yourself, decide for yourself. But this is the way I see it. Nothing is more offensive to somebody than to suggest the covenant that they grew up believing they have with God really is non-existent. It's not a valid present day covenant. You have just alienated them big time. Okay, Olivier, here's what I heard. I heard a terrible abuse of the all Israel will be saved, and I heard that we must not alienate or offend the Jew. You take it from there because this whole statement that I just played is quite troubling. It's very troubling, Jen. Listen, I have a coffee mug on my desk. I'm looking at it. It says, I can do all things through a verse taken out of context. True. As a joke, okay, the coffee mug. But this is exactly what this guy is doing. He's taking Romans 11:26 out of context. The all Israel will be saved is speaking of the Jewish people who will survive the tribulation that right. at the end of the tribulation, at the end of a seven year period of time, and they've survived the second half of the tribulation that was a terrible time, where two thirds of the Jewish people will die, as we read in Zechariah 13, 8 and 9, and the one third that survives is the Israel that will be saved, the same Israel of God that we read about in Galatians 6.16. This man is saying that this is applying to Israel past, present, and future, but there's no ground for that, especially if you look at John 3, when Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and tells him what this guy is trying to tell us, hey, I'm a super Jew here. I'm a rabbi. I'm a head of a school of a Jewish academy. I'm a part of the Sanhedrin. I mean, it doesn't get more Jewish than me, so I'm in. And Jesus says, no, you got to be born of water, physical birth, and born of the spirit. You have to be born again to be able to be part of the body of Messiah. So this all Israel will be saved is completely taken out of context and it's used to shy away from sharing the gospel with the Jewish people. And Jan, I don't know to say it any other way than that, world covenant theology is at the very least soft anti-Semitism because the people are saying, well, we love Israel, we love the Jewish people, let's not bother them. They're in because of their lineage to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So it's like hugging a Jewish person as you push them closer to the edge of the cliff and you push him down to their death without sharing the gospel with them. It's anti-Semitism. It is. I'm glad you said it. That's very blunt and very true. And there's a significant number of pastors teaching this. 
This yes. happened to be a local Twin Cities, Pastor Matt Hammond. I've played the clip before, and Pastor Hammond, you are welcome in the studio anytime to come and talk about this, and we'll have a friendly discussion rather than an argument and talk about it theologically speaking. Trevor, you want to weigh in? Yeah, it's interesting. Just even two chapters earlier, Paul in Romans chapter 9, verse 3 says, I wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh who are Israelites. He's saying that he would rather go to hell so that they could be saved. Why would he say that if they're all currently saved? And even the thing he's quoting of is future tense, which, of course, Olivier elaborated on. And Trevor, you sent me some statistics earlier today. Let me just read a paragraph from Pew Research. A lot of the stats you sent me were intriguing, but this says overall about a quarter of U.S. Jewish adults, or almost 30 percent, do not identify with the Jewish religion. They consider themselves to be Jewish ethnically, culturally, by family background, have a Jewish parent, or they were raised Jewish, but they answer a question about their current religion by describing themselves as, get this, folks, atheist, agnostic, or nothing in particular, rather than as Jewish. Among Jewish adults under 30, 4 in 10 describe this way. So, Trevor, 4 in 10, at least of the young people, say they're atheist, they're agnostic, they're nothing in particular how does this affect you witnessing today? Yeah, Jan, it's been fascinating, actually. We're seeing a greater openness to the possibility of the gospel amongst the Jewish people, particularly the young ones, as a result of this. There's something happening in the Jewish community. In this same document that Pew Research released from 2020, they made the statement that 19% of the American Jewish community now considers themselves Christian. So it's really opened up the gospel. This is fascinating, and it's unprecedented. We've seen times where there's been increase of Jewish people coming to faith. This happened actually right before World War II, interestingly, as Mitch Glazer did his dissertation on, and we saw this during the Jesus People Movement. But during these times, there were increases of faith amongst the general populace. But what's happening here is we're seeing an increase of faith amongst the Jewish population. Like I said, 19%. This is unprecedented in America of the Jewish population professing to be Christians at the same time where we're seeing the general population of faith decline. Never seen this before, Jan. Olivier, you weigh in here. The only thing that I want to add to that is that as I'm doing quite a bit of work with our French team, even though I'm remotely here from the U.S. being on the board, we're seeing similar things happening, especially in the south of France. For the last few years, of course, nothing has been happening much, but one of our workers is in the town of Marseille in the south of France. Just the last couple of days, I talked to him several times, and he said that he could not believe the amount of conversation he's been having with Jewish people interested about hearing about the gospel and very inquisitive and a lot less argumentative than they used to be in the past. Some folks may be asking, why are we even having this conversation? Let me just cite a couple of Bible verses, Galatians 3.28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ. We're talking believers here. Another, 1 Corinthians 12.13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, we were all made to drink of one Spirit all one in Christ. Again, this is referring to believers. So going back to Hebrew roots, if we're all one in Christ, we're all one in Christ. It's simple as that. First of all, the section of scripture that says that there's no longer Jew nor Greek, free nor slave, male nor female, we know there's still male and female. And so the distinction still exists. But what's fascinating about that section of scripture in particular is most Gentiles who read it don't recognize that a Jewish person prays multiple times a day, thanking God that they're not a Gentile, that they're not female, and that they're not a slave, so that they can fulfill all of the law. So what Paul is directly addressing is that salvation's available to everybody. It doesn't matter what your otherwise seeming physical distinctions might be. Salvation's available to all of humanity. And that's really the point that he's making. So what does this matter? Well, There's incredible significance regarding Israel. If you want to find out where we are in the historical timeline for the times that we're in, it always makes sense to look towards Israel. We see in Romans chapter 11, verse 11, it says, I say then, have they stumbled, speaking of Israel, that they should fall? Certainly not, but through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. So there's this way that the gospel seems to spread is that Israel rejects more and more of the nations come to faith. That's just how the Lord has allowed for salvation to spread throughout the world. 
But as we come closer to the end, as it says later in Romans in verse 25, it says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. There seems to be a time frame to where the gospel, it stops spreading throughout the Gentiles, obviously leading into the time of the rapture and some other events. And this is possibly even what we see happening. It's why it seems so incredibly significant. I do want to take time in my part two of my programming to get into some Christian anti-Semitism particularly. I want to play a couple of sound bites that are going to be a little bit on the shocking side. Olivier, I want to come back and I want to ask you a question, and that concerns the Holocaust. And why does God allow anti-Semitism? I know there's a reason, and actually we've kind of discussed that. So I'm going to come back playing a very intriguing soundbite. It's going to be Mark Levin. He's heading back in history, looking at World War II and the abandonment of the Jews by a whole lot of people. I'll stop there and I'll open part two of my programming with that clip. I'm back in just a minute or two. Don't go away. I wrote a book called Unfreedom of the Press based on a lot of research, a lot of scholarship and so forth. And I want to tell you about the New York Times. It's going to take a little while, so just sit back and here we go. In 1984, Dr. David S. Wyman, in his book, The Abandonment of the Jews, not the Holocaust, explained that one reason ordinary Americans were not more responsive to the plight of European Jews during the Holocaust was that very many, probably a majority, were unaware of Hitler's extermination program until well into 1944 or later. The information was not readily available to the public because the mass media treated the systematic murder of millions of Jews as though it were minor news. Now, Mr. Wyman was not Jewish, but he just looked at this and was appalled by it in 1984. He looked, at, looked back. Yet on November 24, 1942, unambiguous evidence of the Nazis' ongoing extermination of European Jews was made publicly available, but was largely ignored by the media. Lack of solid press coverage in the weeks immediately following November 24 muffled the historic news at the outset. In the United States, Wyman asserted, Two or three clear statements from Franklin Roosevelt would have moved this news into public view and kept it there for some time. But the president was not so inclined, nor did Washington reporters press him. In retrospect, it seems almost unbelievable that in Roosevelt's press conferences normally held twice a week, not one word was spoken about the mass killing of European Jews until almost a year later. The president had nothing to say to reporters on the matter, and no correspondent asked him about it. Surely the New York Times, with its wide reach, resources, access to foreign sources of information, reputation as the foremost newspaper in the country, large Jewish readership, and its Jewish ownership, would do everything possible to investigate and disclose the horror of Jewish genocide. But the opposite was true. Wyman explained that the New York Times Jewish-owned but anxious not to be seen as Jewish-oriented was the premier American newspaper of the era. It printed a substantial amount of information on Holocaust-related events, but almost always buried it on the inner pages. And the Washington Post, Jewish-owned Washington Post, printed a few editorials advocating rescue, but only infrequently carried news reports on the European Jewish situation. The other Washington newspapers provided similarly limited information on the mass murder of European Jewry and most of the other press outside New York and Washington, press coverage was even thinner. Fake news, that's worse than fake. I think that little clip said a lot. Before we resume, let me make a quick announcement. We are just off of our Understanding the Times one day conference, May 11th, featuring both Bill Koenig and Michelle Bachman. And this was part of our bi-monthly activities with Olive Tree Ministries and Mark Henry Ministries here in suburban Minneapolis. You can get a DVD of this event for just $10, or you can watch it at our website, olivetreeviews.org, and then go to video at no cost. You can watch it at markhenryministries.com at no cost. Bill Koenig and Michelle Bachman, hosted by Olive Tree Ministries and Mark Henry Ministries, an evening of discussion of current events, apologetics, issues of the day from a biblical perspective. So I'm dealing with the subject of all things Jewish this hour, and I have in studio Trevor Rubenstein, Chosen People Ministries, T. Rubenstein at chosenpeople.com, 
And Olivier Melnick, also with Chosen People Ministries, newantisemitism.com. That's how you can reach these gentlemen. They both are representatives of Chosen People Ministries. Olivier, your mother, I'm quite sure I heard you say, did survive the Holocaust. How do you react to something like you just heard, Mark Levin? We all know the Roosevelt administration looked the other way. In that little clip, we find out the New York Times, owned and operated by Jews, looked the other way during World War II. Everything seemed to be stacked against the Jews, including American leadership. It's very troubling. I've lost members of my family in the Holocaust. My mother's father was taken in front of our eyes when she was 15 years old out of the house where she lived until she passed away a few years ago. As a result, she ended up saying that she couldn't believe in God anymore, which, of course, at the end of her life, I was able to lead her to the Lord. And it was God's way. And I'm very grateful for that. But it's not uncommon for Jewish people to react that way. This reminds me, Jan, of the terrible story called The Voyage of the St. Louis, which is a ship that left Hamburg, Germany in 1939. And on it, there was like 937 passengers, 95% of them Jewish. 1939 was the beginning of the war, and they had required papers to make safe entry in Cuba. And then from Cuba, where they're going to go to the States. Well, unbeknownst to them, when they arrived in Cuba, all their entries had been revoked. They could not even leave the ship. So the ship moved north to the States to see if they could land there and They were denied entry in Florida, and they even went as far as Canada. They were denied entry. They ended up going back to Europe, and the passengers were split between Belgium, Netherlands, England, and France, about 25% each. They were taken by those four countries, but at the end, 254 of the passengers ended up perishing in the Holocaust. You have this terrible story of unwanted, the story of the wandering Jew trying to save themselves from the war at the time that the Jewish people didn't really know how bad it was going to get, but they still wanted to get out and nobody wanted them. The American government actually was given intel to bomb Auschwitz and they said they could not do this. They didn't have the resources to do this because they needed all the resources to do other things, but they actually bombed some factories five miles from Auschwitz and they ignored the Jewish people in the camps. Trevor, you want to weigh into this? Just one of the tragedies, Jan, unfortunately. The world hates what God loves, and so we see this perpetual hatred of God's people, and it just continues to grow. And unfortunately, it's something that even in our time, we're seeing quite an expansion on. Olivier's an expert in this area, but it's something that we're seeing here even locally through Christians. I'm heading there, and I think I'll head there now, and that's Christian anti-Semitism. Let me just read... Some of our listeners are aware of this, and others get quite upset when it's brought up. Martin Luther hoped initially he would attract Jews to his Protestant faith, understanding that they could not accept the superstitions and persecution of Rome, but when they rejected his attempts to convert them, he turned on them and uttered words of hatred, words used by the Nazis in their propaganda. What shall we Christians do with this cursed, rejected race of the Jews? This is Luther talking. First, their synagogues should be set on fire. Secondly, their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed. Thirdly, they should be deprived of their prayer books and their Talmuds. Fourthly, their rabbis must be forbidden under threat of death to teach any more. Fifthly, passport and traveling privileges should be absolutely forbidden to the Jews. Sixthly, they ought to be stopped from usury. Seventh, let the young and strong Jews be given the flail, the axe, the spade, the distaff, and the spindle, and let them earn their bread by the sweat of their noses. To sum up, dear princes and nobles who have Jews in your domains, if this advice of mine does not suit you, then find a better one, so that you and we may all be free of this insufferable, devilish burden, the Jews. Again, Olivier, that is coming from Martin Luther. Yes, and Jan, Martin Luther, at the beginning of his Protestant ministry, wrote several sermons on the Jews, and we need to say that, several sermons on the Jews. You would read them today, you would go, this was written by a Messianic Jewish believer who was very theologically sound. Beautiful sermons on Romans and the Jews, and then he turned. We could spend the rest of the show trying to speculate on why he turned. What we need to understand is not so much why he turned. Was it old age? Was it anti-Semitism? But the point is that he said it. It's part of history. And my people, the Jewish people, know very well that he said it. Too many Christians don't even know that Luther said that. They get caught off guard when the Jewish person says, well, what about Luther? And they look and they go, what about him? 
people need to educate themselves on what happened there. I think there was a part of it that was anti-Semitism, but I think it's more complex than yes. that. But people, they're saying, well, why don't we take the book of the Jews and their lives, which is a book that he wrote, Luther, why don't we just take it out of his life work? I said, no, it's like cancel culture. You can't do that. It exists. You have to look at it, read it, and then defend the truth and say that this is not what the Jewish people are all about. But you know what? Hitler used Luther yeah. in Mein Kampf, and he said he was only finishing what Luther started. That's a really important point. Talking to Olivier Melnick, Chosen People Ministries, Trevor Rubenstein, also Chosen People Ministries, I want to play a couple of clips, and I opened the whole hour emphasizing some ministries. And one is this True News, Rick Wiles. I want to play... A very short clip of Rick, and then I want to play just a little bit longer one of his cohort, Doc Burkhart. The real reason they won't say anything is because the real agenda is Israel. Yes. Wow. And they're not going to jeopardize their standing with the White House to get things done for Israel. Yeah, I can see that. That's the real reason. Yes. So they will, they will look the other way about sin and keep their mouth shut. And so they're pushing the agenda because they have control of Washington. They have tro control of the Trump administration. Donald Trump is owned by the Jews. That's the truth. Now I want to follow that up. His cohort, Doc Burkhart, and here he is chastising the three of us because we love the Jewish people. And if you love the Jewish people, you're getting it too from Doc Burkhart. Why any believer would get hoodwinked and suckered, suckered into this. In fact, James says, who has bewitched you? Who has put you under a spell? It says clearly here in Isaiah what Zion is. Why would, why would you want dirt when you can have heaven? Mm, why would you want a building made of stone when you can have the living temple that you dwell with forever? Why would you trade something material for something heavenly and spiritual? And you don't have to. You don't have to. Maybe you're watching this today and maybe you've said to yourself, you know, I don't know what to believe anymore. I'm so confused. Yes, Satan is confusing people today. He's the author of confusion. He wants us to take our eyes off Jesus by looking at a third temple, by looking at uh, building a greater piece of real estate extending from the Nile all the way to Euphrates and taking over all these nations. And that's the goal. That's the goal to take over all this region and to make that sphere of influence uh, to last in their minds eternally. Mm. When they call Jerusalem the eternal capital of Israel, they're replacing God with Jerusalem. Because they're saying Jerusalem is eternal. There's only one thing that's truly eternal, and that's God the Father. That's the only one. The only one. And so if you're watching this today and you say, Doc, I've never seen it before. I've never understood it before. What do I do? You need to repent right now. You need to call out to God right now and say, God, I, uh, Lord, I'm so sorry. I don't know how I was so deceived. I don't know how I was so bewitched. By, by all of this, I thought it was a good thing to support the people of Israel. I thought it was a good thing to help Israel. But now I see it's just people using the name of Israel, people using the people of Israel in order to line their own pockets, in order to build their own kingdoms, in order to make themselves feel important. But Lord, right now I repent. I turn away from it. I look the other way now. Jesus, you are my Zion. Jesus. You are my Zion. Jesus, you are my promised land. Jesus, you are my temple. Jesus, you are my eternal capital, Lord. Amen. Right now in the name of Jesus, if you've said that and you've turned away from that, then the Lord's going to begin to do a work in your heart and your life. Trevor, these gentlemen identify as evangelical Christians. Wow. The idea that Israel is going to somehow oppress the nations of the world. Show me one biblical prophecy where Israel is oppressing the nations. It's always Israel who is oppressed. It's always Israel who is going to suffer. It's never Israel who does this to other nations. And so it's not even close to being accurate. And of course, so many of our prophecies, Jan, whenever we see information about the return of Jesus, he comes back to a Jewish Jerusalem. Amen. If we're fighting against 
the Jewish people, going back to anti-Semitism and trying to eliminate them. If there's no Jewish people, then that prophecy would be false. It's a work of the enemy. If the Jewish people are not in Israel, then those prophecies would be false. If the Jewish people do not have Jerusalem, then those prophecies would be false. So these types of teachings, Jan, are working directly with Satan in opposing what God promised would happen. Olivier Melnick, you weigh in here. This might help your listener understand if we connect this with a couple of end times prophecies. Please. End of the tribulation when the Jewish people who survived the seven-year tribulation realize that they missed the Messiah the first time. Their forefathers missed the Messiah. According to Zechariah 12.10, mm. they are going to call upon one of their fears and mourn for him like one mourns for an only son. At that time, and a lot of Christians don't know that, it is when Israel corporately repents and calls on him and says, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord, which is something that Jesus told them, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is you who comes in the name of the Lord. At the end of the tribulation, when the Jews say that, Jesus comes back. And that is the end of Satan's career. And like I tell people all the time, mm -hmm. Satan does not care for his retirement plan. That's right. So Satan tries everything to accomplish two goals. Plan A is to turn the Jews against Yeshua to stop them from calling on him. And plan B is to turn the world against the Jews to kill them all in case plan A fails. Satan is working over time to recruit outside of the church people to go after the Jewish people to do just that. And when I listen to those two guys, I'm thinking part of Satan's plan is to use anybody he can to go after the Jews. In 1904, 1905, there was a man by the name of Sergei Nihilus who wrote a booklet that is still sold in the large numbers today. You can even find it on Amazon, don't waste your money, called The Protocol of the Learned Elders of Zion. Yes. It's supposed to be a cabal against the world. It's a bunch of Jewish leaders getting together. It's the minutes of their meetings saying we're going to take over the world, we're going to kill the Christians. And so when I hear those two guys, it's the protocols of the elders of Zion in action. In the same vein, and I'm looking at stats on just general anti-Semitism, Breitbart News, anti-Semitic incidents hit all-time high in the U.S. and goes on to say the Anti-Defamation League reported Tuesday that the number of recorded anti-Semitic incidents all-time high, this goes back to 2021, an average of more than seven incidents per day, 34% increase over a year, including assaults, harassment, vandalism. ADL also reported a 167% increase in assaults against Jews. Listen to this, anti-Semitic crime in New York City up 300%. Trevor, I think we need to clarify, I referred to it earlier, and that's Zechariah 12, that everyone towards the end times, and particularly in the tribulation, is going to come against the Jews. And actually, the immigration statistics coming from America going to Israel because of anti-Semitism yes. have increased yes. dramatically. It used to be a trickle. Now it's a very steady stream largely because of what's occurring, unfortunately. But of course, this makes sense, Jan, where it looks like if all the nations of the world, according to Zechariah 12, at one time will gather against Jerusalem to eliminate the people of Israel, if that is supposed to happen, and of course, the believers are the only ones that truly support Israel outside of the Jewish people themselves, will be gone. And who's going to be left to defend them? One of you made the statement that God allowed the Holocaust out of the Holocaust came the nation of Israel, rebirth of Israel, and out of all of this anti-Semitism, and maybe it was you, Olivier, they're heading to Israel, correct? Yeah, and Trevor has given a lot of numbers from the U.S., and I work with the U.S., but also with Europe. In France, for instance, I believe in the last 15 years, from my own research, there's about 10% of the French population, which at the time was mm -hmm. about 500,000, which is the third largest in the U.S., Israel, U.S., and France, as far as the Jewish communities, and 50,000 Jews moved to Israel. It's really started in large numbers in 2015 after the kosher supermarket attack right. on the edge of Paris. And they continue to go. And it's difficult even for me to say, but is it possible that God would allow anti-Semitism so that the Jews would go back to the land in preparation for the end times? Oh, yes, I think so. That may sound extreme, but yes. There's yeah. something that I want to say that all three of us would agree that we are in the final minutes of the 11th hour. Amen. So we know the next event is going to be the rapture. It's signless. We don't know. It's imminent. It could happen during this program, we don't know when. But here's the thing, when I talk to people who love Israel and who love the Jewish people and they don't know what to do, they go, How do I, what do I do to reach the Jewish people? I say, listen, 
any Jewish person you talk to, Jewish male in particular, that you talk to, you might be planting a seed in their head, in their heart, and then they will not make it in the rapture, but they could be one of the 144,000. Yes. So don't think that you're toiling in vain when you talk to Jewish people. Share the gospel, they need to hear it, and if they're rejected, they could be one of the 144,000 world evangelists that will do a great work for the kingdom after we're gone. Trevor, you want to weigh in there? So what we have going on here as we see the anti-Semitism increase, as we see more and more Jewish people coming yeah. to faith, as we see a decline of faith amongst the Gentiles, at least in this country, it all seems to be pointing, Jan, that we're getting so close. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we looked at other things as to see what time frame are we in? How close are we to the end times? But God's timetable, like I said, is always Israel. And this is so telling with all of the statistics that we're seeing. You are listening to Understanding the Times Radio. Jan Markell have in studio Trevor Rubenstein from Chosen People. You can reach him at trubenstein at chosenpeople.com. You can reach my other guest, Olivier Melnick at newantisemitism.com. Both of them represent Chosen People Ministries. You know, Trevor, some people comment that Christians care more about Israel than the Jews do. Do you encounter that? It depends, Jan. Sometimes American Jews, we don't necessarily have a historic connection to Mm -hmm. the land of Israel because many of us haven't ever been there and our ancestors haven't lived there for over 2,000 years. So there can be a disconnection, unfortunately. But yes, amongst the Christian people, because of the promises that we absolutely believe in within the scriptures, and we have a love for that land, we have a love for the people, we're excited to see the Lord come back and rule and reign from Jerusalem. And of course, the Christian people have a great heart for the Jewish people. We love them, Jan, also because it's like Paul said, without them, there would be no Messiah. There would be no Savior of the world. And so it's a debt that could never be paid back. And we see things happening, and it's hurtful to Christians. Olivier, and we're running just a little bit short on time here, but I'd like you to address this best as you can. I have some thoughts on it myself. But so often, the Jewish people vote for the very candidate that's going to turn around and hurt them the most. Can you help us understand that? This is the most puzzling thing. Yeah. When you see where the left is right now, I think the best way I can understand this in my own head is that when the Jewish community became interested in the left, it was in the days of the Kennedys, where the left back then was a lot more center than it is today. Mm -hmm. Today, we have a left that has become pretty much Marxist. Right. But the Jewish people, I'm finding also that the Jewish people that are interested in liberalism and leftism also seem to be less interested than they used to be in Israel in general. But it's still very puzzling. I don't understand when you see how the left, the squad, and how they throw Israel under the bus constantly. I don't know if you know, Rashida Tlaib tried to pass a resolution to make the Nakba, which is the catastrophe, which is a reference to an Arabic word meaning the day of May 14th, 1948, Israel Independence Day. She wants it to be recognized as the catastrophe where the Palestinians were kicked out of Israel and not recognized as Israel's Independence Day. She's trying to pass that in the U.S. That is correct. Well, this is a question that comes into me by email very frequently, and I know some of the Parents and grandparents of today's Jewish population come from some socialist countries. Some of them come from Russia. All they know is socialism. They end up here and they still embrace that socialism. It's just puzzling because today's left, other than perhaps a Joe Manchin or a few that are more centrist, they hate Israel and they hate the Jews. And yet Jewish people vote for them almost every election. Any comment, Trevor? Jan, we're actually seeing a change in that. I'm glad you brought that up. So still, the majority of Jewish people are, as far as their voting record, very left-leaning. But that's declining. As we're seeing an increase of religion amongst the Jewish people, what I mean by that is there's less Jewish people that consider themselves religious, but there's more that consider themselves orthodox. Also, there's more Jewish people that now consider themselves believers in Jesus. As we're seeing an increase of that, those people, Jan, that are prescribing to specific moral values and are prescribing to the importance of Israel, they are becoming more and more conservative. So we are seeing that. And then even evangelistically, and this was fascinating, if a Jewish person finds themselves more conservative leaning and they don't want to be orthodox, they find it hard to be involved with a community that isn't left leaning. So Mm -hmm. they often are looking to things of Jesus. 
Olivier and I am down to about a minute, minute and a half. But if you had that minute and a half and you were to talk face to face with a pastor right now, what would you tell him? God is certainly not done with Israel. We have not even discussed replacement theology. That is right. Two-thirds of Christians today believe that the church has replaced Israel. Thank you for inserting that. That is important. I I would tell the pastor, listen, my Bible tells me that God is not done with Israel. As a matter of fact, this program is going to resume with Israel very soon, and we need to do everything we can to take as many Jewish people with us before the rapture as we possibly can. And that's the only way to do it is not to recognize their descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but to recognize that, like everybody else, they're sinners who need to be saved by the blood of Yeshua on the cross. I think both you gentlemen would be encouraged if the church would address some of the issues we're talking about today, including witnessing to the Jewish people. And Romans chapter 10 is addressed specifically to Israel, and it is the section of scripture that says, how will they know unless we tell them? There's an interesting statistic that came out done by Lifeway where they said that the same amount of people that pray for the salvation of Jewish Mm -hmm. people is about the same percentage of people that share the gospel with Jewish people. I want to go out of the program with a little saying I learned years ago, don't remember where.